And we're live. Welcome, everyone. My name is Eliane Ramos, and I'll be your hostess tonight. Um, I have uh, a very special show tonight. Uh, it's International Men's Health Week. And so to celebrate, we want to talk a little bit about the health of Latino men. Um, as we know, Latino men are not only notorious for not going to the doctor, but they also suffer from a series of conditions that are very, um, very, um, you know, very Latino. And, and you know, we're going to be discussing some of these conditions later. Um, we also know that Latino men tend to not have health insurance, and um, we're going to be talking about what are some of the options that Latino men now have with the Affordable Care Act um, in, in the different options that are available because of it. Um, and what, what all of these um, things mean for Latino men is that there needs to be a lot of education done for, for our men um, to take care of their health. And so what, we, what I have done tonight is invite a group of experts who have been very closely um, associated with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. And they're going to be sharing a lot of different tips and a lot of different um, in, um, pieces of information that are very helpful for Latino men. And so my guests tonight are George Askew, Dr. George Askew, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the Administration of Children and Families for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. How are you, Dr. Askew? I'm well, thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the show. And second, we have Stephen who is the uh, Senior Health Policy Analyst at the National Council of La Raza, NCLR. Stephen, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me tonight. And we also have with us Jose Plaza, who is the Director of Latino Engagement for Enroll America. Welcome, Jose. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and so um, we, we I, I briefly introduced the idea of Lat um, Men's Health Week. So can uh, you guys tell me what Men's Health Week is and what is it that we're celebrating this week? Who wants to go first? Well, I think, you know, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, <laughs> Men's Health Week is a chance for us to, to celebrate the special, the, the special health needs and concerns uh, for men. Uh, when I think of men's health, I think of health in general, of course, certainly the, the physical uh, and, and mental uh, threats to, to, to well-being for, for men in general, but there's also some specific things that we want to address with respect to men, uh, things that, that they're at a greater risk for, so things like uninten unintentional injury, cancer, uh, heart disease, and the important, uh, the important thing about these sort of categories of illness when we're, when we're thinking about uh, sort of the Men's Health Week is that these things are preventable. And so uh, we want to put men in a position where we can help them engage with their own health, help them engage with the healthcare system to prevent uh, outcomes that will, you know, re result as again uh, things like unintentional injury, cancer, uh, and heart disease. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm and um, what are some of the, um, you know, we we I, I spoke briefly in the introduction about the the health conditions that affect Latinos in particular. And I'm sorry that the camera is going a little slow <laughs> tonight, but um, what are some of these health concerns that Latino men need to keep in mind and take care of? Well, I, I, again, I, I, I kind of like to think of it a little bit, a little bit broadly. So there are certain things that some men uh, should uh, should all uh, be uh, attuned to, and and I think Latino men in, in particular. So we all want to make sure that we're checking our blood pressure. Uh, you know, Latino men, men of color, uh, we all want to make sure that we're uh, attuned to being uh, aware of our, our obesity status or our weights, our weight and, and nutrition status. Uh, being sure that we we've been checked or screened for things like diabetes. And kidney disease, all the things that, again, these are preventable things that uh, we need to make sure we have our men engaged in preventive services. Uh, the one, the one the great thing about the Affordable Care Act, of course, is that it makes uh, access to affordable, quality health care um, much easier uh, for, for men than it has been, particularly for Latino men. Mm 
Mm -hmm. There's a related question here from social media. As, as you know, I've been asking people to send me questions for the past week. And uh, we have here Ruben Alcazar who is asking something related to this. Is What type of health screenings should younger men do on a regular basis? And what about men over 40? Sure. Any, uh, anyone want to tackle that one? Sure. Well, you know, I'm I'm, ha I'm ha happy to, to to jump in again and then to turn it over to my, my colleagues. But again, the, the things that I, I mentioned before, uh, young men uh, should particularly be looking at things like blood pressure checks and getting their blood pressure under control, checking them, checking for for diabetes, uh, checking again for obesity, uh, kidney disease. Uh, I think the most important thing, though, is to engage with a primary care doctor. A primary care doctor, or and not necessarily a primary care doctor, could be a primary care nurse practitioner and primary care physician's assistant, someone who's helping guide them along the pathway to, to better health and can help advise them on their relative risk and benefits of different screenings and what they should be doing at different ages, at early ages and at older ages. Yeah, and I think one of the, and thank you, Doctor, I think you, you add a lot of um, great information to this, but also uh, for, we've seen a rise in STDs. Um, around young Latinos and so one of the things we want to remind folks is that um, HIV and STD you can actually get those health screenings um, free of cost now um, and so preventative health care is, is something that uh, the ACA is bringing forth to our community and uh, you know we already mentioned you know close to uh, a little bit more than 10 million Latinos are actually benefiting um, from ACA and close to 913,000 young Latinos between the ages of uh, 19 and 25 now will have access to, to these preventative services. So it's definitely a, an area that we want to focus on. I guess the only thing that I would add to, to both of um, the presenters is just in general getting our community to think about this culture of coverage and, um, you know, Dr. Askew mentioned about you know developing a relationship with your primary care provider um, and getting into the habit of you know seeking preventive services when you need it, making sure that you know your health and, and health care needs are, are part of your daily, or not daily, but part of your regular um, life. That it's it's not something that you just think about when you know you need to go to the emergency department or when you have an accident, but it's something that you incorporate. Um, that becomes part of, of your normal routine. Um. Yeah, and I think we lost Elian, um, but hopefully she'll join us. Um, but I think we can definitely continue the conversation. Sure, um, sure. And Stephen, while, while you were talking, I know that NCLR has done a lot of work around the Latino population. Right. Uh, can you share a little bit about some of the, the barriers that Latinos face when, when it comes to accessing care? Definitely. Um, and so we know, you know, the Latino community has one of the highest rates of, of uninsured um, across the country. And I think there are, you know, there are a couple of reasons that, you know, there are some barriers that we face, um, that men face in particular. One of those things is um, offers of, of health insurance mm -hmm. coverage via an employer. Uh, we are represented or overly pre represented in industries that don't offer health insurance um, as a regular benefit. So, you know, you can think of different sectors where our, our community is working. Um, and so that's an access barrier. If you don't have access to coverage, it makes it that much more difficult um, to get services. So I think that's one thing that we have seen, um, you know, through our work at NCLR um, throughout the community is, is having access to health insurance. And so that's one of the benefits of, of the Affordable Care Act is that now it provides new opportunities for folks. Um, who, who in the past didn't have those opportunities. Another, I think, um, barrier for vulnerable populations uh, is linguistic, um, uh, linguistic and culturally competent care, uh, making sure that, you know, the providers um, that you see, the services that you obtain, um, that they are both linguistically and culturally competent. And I think for folks who may be a little bit hesitant about seeking care from someone who may not speak their language, um, or who are, who's providing services that, um, you know, it's not the language that they prefer. Uh, maybe a physician that may not, may not understand their cultural beliefs or, or have some type of uh, knowledge about, you know, the cultural, um, the cultural history that they bring uh, to, to their providers. So th those things, um, I think, can serve as, as a barrier. Um, also, we know that for folks in, you know, immigrant communities, um, 
there can be some hesitation uh, about seeking care, um, but also, you know, from coming from their home countries, maybe a lack of familiarity with how the system functions here in the United States, um, and, and having to gain familiarity about accessing um, that system system in order to, to access services. Um, there are a number of, of others, but I think those are some of the key ones uh, that we've seen throughout our work here at NCLR. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. I, and I apologize because I got kind of kicked out a little bit there. Um, I don't know what's going on. There's a big storm here in, in um, my area, so that might be part of it too. I, but, think, it's, I think it's headed my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys be safe out there, huh? <laughs> Um, well, let's continue in that in that same uh, vein that, that Stephen and, and Stephen. Thank you so much for for briefing us in in the great work that NCLR has been doing in terms of research for Latino, um, you know, conditions um, in 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 the health area. Um, but we know that Latino men are notorious. We're not going to the doctor. We mentioned that in the beginning. But do you guys have any idea how we can cross that barrier and like maybe get our men to to um, to start going to the doctor? And, and how do we overcome this thing that is so embedded in our culture? I, I can jump on that. So um, one of the things that we've learned at Enroll America. Um, through various surveys, just as NCLR mentioned with their research, um, and we actually saw that this last. Uh, open enrollment, um, around 72% of Latinos that were actually enrolling um, said that they faced issues both of access, um, but also in, not only linguistically, as Tima was mentioning, um, but this cultural knowledge. Um, the majority of Latinos that ended up enrolling did it with in-person assistance, or they sought in-person assistance before going ahead and enrolling via the website or through the phone. Um, and so I think one of the biggest things, and um, I know that several of the Latino partners uh, that are working across the country to, to get access to Latinos um, are focusing on bringing that information uh, to Latino communities in culturally competent ways. Uh, here at Enroll, we've been working both with the media, with Latino surrogates, um, getting trusted sources both via faith and the health community to be able to provide uh, those messages to Latinos. Uh, from Latinos that they trust and folks that, that speak their language and look like them. So I think that's a great tactic for those that are doing this type of work is um, find those trusted community members and have them become the voice to, to reach your community. Uh, I def oh. well, go right ahead, Steve. No, I definitely <laughs> agree with Jose. You know, through our work, we, we know that you know, our community values that in-person touch and being able to, you know, interact with someone face-to-face. -face. I think, too, uh, you know, there's there's a premium placed in, in the community, and I would say, you know, in other communities too, on on family, right, um, and and taking care of your loved ones. And I think one of the the messages that we tried to communicate out there is, you know, getting covered um, as a way to, you know, be there for for your loved ones, right? If if you're not going to be able to to take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of them? And I think, you know, creating again that sense of this is something that you do for yourself. It's something that you do for your family. Um, just one quick story that I'll share. A, a friend of mine, uh, he had really put off his health um, for a number of years, and then he had a child. And you know, he was telling me one day, he's like, I didn't, didn't really prioritize my health that much, but I look at my daughter, right? And I see that you know, she's only a baby, but I want to make sure that I'm going to be there for her graduations, for her weddings, to see my grandchildren. And so I know that I need to make my health a priority um, because now there are more lives depending on me and there are, there are more generations that I want to be around for. And so again, I think, you know, rooting the message in, in this sense of community, in this sense of family, in the sense of doing it for yourself but also for your loved ones, I think it is helpful um, to sort of nudge, particularly in Latino men, uh, to, to make health more of a priority for themselves. Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you guys more. I, you know, I, I, and I think to you know, I, I look at two particular populations of folks: uh, mothers and children. Uh, you know, if, if we can, you know, engaging mothers around uh, 
uh, encouraging their their the men in their lives uh, to 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 seek health care, as well as you know, as you said, the the father looking at the child and saying, "Wow, I want to be there when she's around." Well, you you can engage uh, older kids and sort of you know bringing your dad along to the doctor when you go, or or, or young men bringing older men to the doctor as sort of take your dad to the doctor. Um, I think those are you know I think those are the, you, you it's a trusted source, and you feel like you're actually you, you're doing something not just for you, as you said, but but for your family and for your uh, and for your community by taking care of your own health. Very true, very true. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, on that same vein, um, very true, I just got a question from Facebook and I'm going to read it to you. It has to do with the same thing that we're talking about, taking care of our family, right? We have a question from Susana Sandoval who is talking here about her father and how um, she would like to know more about any prostate cancer initiatives since her father is battling that condition and um, our community is struggling with this condition. So what, what are your recommendations, um, doctor or anyone who wants to jump in? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. This gets, this gets back again to um, my response regarding um, connecting with a primary care physician. I think getting getting men of all ages connected with their primary care doctor who can help guide them along this path. They can talk to them about the relative risks uh, that they might have for a particular illness, um, what the risk factors are that they have and what the risk and benefits of any particular screening. So with respect to prostate cancer, asking the questions about what are the tests that are available to me, what are the risks and benefits, what are the, the, the pluses and minuses of getting a screening test or not getting a screening test. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a very individual decision. And so connecting again with that primary care provider who can help you, help guide you through that decision, I think is, is critical there. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of, of benefits and, in, in, um, you know, different kind of services that are available now, what are, what are some of those services, the preventive services that are available now to men thanks to the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think one of the things that the Affordable Care Act does that's, that's terrific is really it makes a significant step towards addressing uh, addressing d health and health dis health care disparities. So, you know, we've talked about some of these things already. The Affordable Care Act prohibits discrimination and improves the quality of care and data collection, requires workforce cultural competence and language services, it reduces costs, uh, expands access to affordable health care and insurance, and eliminates unfair insurance practices. And one of the things that we, we think is, is, is a tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, benefit to the, the Affordable Care Act is that um, you can't be denied coverage because you have a pre-existing condition, uh, which in pre-existing conditions uh, disproportionately affected minority populations uh, who suffer more chronic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So again, the ACA prevents insurance companies from charging higher premiums also based on gender uh, or race. And uh, so again, we're very proud of that with respect to the Affordable Care Act, and I think it's going to go a long way towards ending health care disparities. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand that there's also changes in terms of the Medicaid eligibility, aren't there? Um, and, and anybody can jump in to this. I know you all work on the, on the same um, issues. Yeah. I mean, historically, um, well, can I just go back to the preventive services real quick? Sure, sure. We, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, we know that Latinos in particular, you know, we, we have higher rates of obesity and, and diabetes, which are risk factors for, you know, things like heart disease. And so, you know, one of the great things about the ACA is that it provides, you know, diabetes screening, um, obesity um, screening and counseling, um, nutrition counseling. So these are, you know, are free services um, that folks can access to, to prevent, right, the development of these these more complex and uh, more expensive chronic diseases. And so I think that's key for folks to, to know. Um, something else, you know, that's in there that we don't really talk about, I feel like, as a community, um, that there's depression uh, screening and, and counseling. And so there's a mm -hmm. mental health component to these preventive services, which I think, you know, for folks who needed this resource for a long time, they now have access um, to it uh, via, you know, these, these um, free screenings. So I think that's key. Uh, so linking now back to the, the Medicaid issue, you know, historically Medicaid has been um, a program that was for, you know, low-income kids, pregnant women, uh, the disabled, um, but through the ACA, um, it called for the expansion of Medicaid um, eligibility up to 138% uh, of the federal poverty level. There was a, 
Supreme Court decision, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but now Medicaid uh, expansion is a, is a state option, right? And so um, there are still 24 states that haven't expanded uh, Medicaid eligibility. And that's particularly important for Latinos. Um, two states, in particular Texas and Florida, that haven't expanded, uh, there are nearly 800,000 Latinos who are shut out of insurance coverage um, because of those state decisions. And so I think that's something that folks need to be aware of, um, that you know, the at wearing the advocacy hat for a quick second, um, to know that there are policymakers out there who have power to open the doors for health insurance in those states, particularly for, for Latinos and other communities of color, um, so that they can have access to the preventive services that we've been talking about, so they, they can have access to the providers that Dr. Askew was talking about and to the to other benefits. So I think that's important for folks to remember, right, that not all states have expanded and it it's, has a particular impact on the Latino community. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to add to that, you know, and uh, people, you know, how to get your your representatives' numbers. You know how to apply pressure to these people, call them, write to them. You know, do whatever you have to do. Um, if you really want to get um, this coverage, you you this is something that we cannot leave on somebody else's hands. We have to get involved ourselves. And yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. And since and since we're talking about men, um, now men are eligible. To, to access the Medicaid program, right? So, I mean, it was definitely a win for those folks who, you know, didn't have children, who were, you know, single childless adults that they now have access to, you know, a, a, a pathway to insurance coverage that didn't exist before the ACA. Nice, very nice. And, you know, even more reason to, you know, to put pressure on your representatives. I'm, I'm going to go back to, to Dr. Askew here. You're the first Chief Medical Officer for the Administration for Children and Families. I have to read it because it's a long title. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what are some of the programs that the ACA has now that, that um, have been put in place to address the needs of families and especially of men? Well, um, the one thing that I'm very proud of at, at, uh, at ACF is that we did bring on a chief medical officer, so I'm very excited to be in this position. And I, I often talk about, in my prior work, not having the right prescription. I could treat a sore throat with a prescription. I could treat a busted ankle with a, with a, and, and wrap it up. I, I, could treat an, I could treat an ammonia with a prescription. But I didn't have a prescription for poverty or inadequate access to early care and education or inadequate access to health care services. And uh, what I have uh, as work as chief medical officer at ACF, which is a huge, which as I always say, we put the HS in HHS, uh, is a slew of services uh, and those things which I refer to as the social determinants of health, which really have a tremendous impact on health outcomes, much greater uh, impacts than anything I can do in my clinical practice. So the work that we do at ACF around child care and asset building and uh, working with runaway and homeless youth, refugees and immigrant populations, uh, all contribute to uh, making uh, sort of better health outcomes through investments in human services, um, and particularly around investments in minority populations and Latino populations, um, where making social service investments leads to uh, improved health outcomes. So that's sort of the the what I'm trying to push for in my role at, at ACF is making this connection again between investments in human services and health outcomes. Mm -hmm. I want to make a quick parenthesis here to let everybody know um, um, our representative from HHS, Gina Rodriguez, has been on the chat room. So if you have questions that you want to send in live, uh, she's there. She's going to be addressing those questions on the chat. Uh, so you're more than welcome to send them in. Uh, I now have a question for Jose and Stephen, for, for all of you, really. Uh, this also happens to be Pride Month, and uh, you know, as you know, um, you know, being gay, being in the LGBT community is not something that is discussed in our community necessarily. Um, but we also know that there are some provisions now that protect people who are in the LGBTQ community. So, what are those provisions that that have been put in place to ensure that they also get coverage? Well, as, as we know, the administration, President Obama, has actually um, done a lot of sweeping reform to, to assist the LGBT community. Um, and within that, the ACA actually has a lot of coverage uh, for, for LGBT folks 
um, specifically looking at um, gay and transgender men. Uh, now there isn't, you know, we, we've been talking about pre-existing conditions for those that suffer from HIV or STIs or even for transgender um, folks that are, are looking to go through the process. We were talking about mental health not being accessible, um, you know, which is, is part of the process. Um, you know, depending on where you live, uh, medication can also be covered. Um, uh, Center for American Progress, um, they launched a great campaign called Out to Enroll, uh, which provided a lot of information. And I think one of the benefits um, of ACA is that regardless of the Latino community isn't as ready to accept um, members of our community as LGBT, um, medical professionals are now not allowed to discriminate, charge more, or turn away folks if they do need these services. Uh, so anything from uh, HIV protection, you know, for against STIs, as I mentioned, for folks that are going through um, through transition for for transgender individuals, uh, there's services there for them now. Um, and again, it'll it'll depend where you live. Um, there's the new drug Truvada um, or PrEP. You know, if you live in a state where Medicare has expanded, uh, more than likely you will get that covered. Uh, so there's a lot of services that, that are offered, um, but it also depends where you live, and so I definitely do recommend that folks uh, visit that. There's another website that I want to share. It's called HIVHealthReform.org, where you can go in and actually see um, where your state stands in, in terms of coverage um, and in helping you uh, uh, cover you know, the expense of, of HIV medication. So there, there are various benefits. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the website again? I'm sorry, Jose. Go, sure. Go. So I mentioned two programs. It's outtoenroll.org, um, and it's a campaign specifically for the LGBT community to provide unique uh, information and Q&A, um, you know, for for the community. So it's outtoenroll.org uh, for folks that need information on HIV and coverage in their specific state. They can go to hivhealthreform.org. Mm -hmm. And doctor, you had something to say. Go ahead. Doctor Askew? I think he's on mute. <laughs> oh my god. Can you unmute your phone? I think you're, you're on mute, Doctor. Not sure what's going on. One, one of the things that I was going to say um, is that there's also a new civil rights protection in the ACA. It's section 1557. Um, and it prohibits discrimination on a variety of factors, such as race, color, national origin, sex, um, etc. And so I think that's that's critical because providers can't discriminate, um, marketplaces can't discriminate, and so I think folks need to be aware that there is this new civil rights law um, to protect consumers, and I think it's especially important for the LGBT community uh, to be aware of that, and that there are, there's also um, a process to appeal if you feel like you have been discriminated against um, through the Office of Civil Rights and at the Health and Human Services Department. That is awesome. Um, there, there's so many things. Go ahead, Doctor. Now oh, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm back on. Uh, well, I just wanted to make clear <laughs> that, that, we, that we, there are a couple of other uh, sites uh, folks should, should know about. Um, you know, the, one of the best places to find answers uh, for your questions is on healthcare.gov, of mm -hmm. course. Um, you can search in the min menu option for all topics, and you can. Uh, uh, and you'll find a, a great deal of information. Uh, you can also find official resources on the CMS website under Education and Outreach uh, Health Insurance Marketplace. So again, um, while not specifically for men, these are great resources that answer a great many questions you're going to have around the Affordable Care Act and, and new, new availability and access to care. That's awesome. Um, well, another, another, you know, to to switch the subject a little bit. Not that this is not important, but there, there's another um, disease, another um, ailment that people don't really talk about much in our community, and that is mental health. Mm -hmm. And I have a question now again from Facebook. Um, one of our viewers, Emmy Marino. She is asking about mental health and how do we help Latino men become more accepting of these illnesses and more willing to seek and obtain treatment? I, I think one of the biggest things, and, and in terms of um, getting Latinos just to talk about health, is, um, is an issue of education. Um, 
we we as a community need to start talking about it. The media needs to start talking about it. Um, I know our parents they turn to you know Univision and Telemundo and you know traditional press uh, for information. And so um, now that we have access to these preventative services, we need to begin talking about it. We need to talk about it in in terms where our parents and our family members will understand. Um, and I think it's going to take some time in order to uh, have folks understand that. It is preventative, and this is the best thing about ACA, that it provides access to preventative services. Um, so it's a matter of creating materials, creating campaigns um, that ed educate our community from the youngest to the oldest. Um, you know, we've seen in recent events everything that, that has some correlation to mental health, um, and so it, it is part of our daily life. So um, access to educational materials uh, that are in our language, that are competent, um, and, and that address the issues, and and remove the stigma of having to go to a doctor uh, because of that. So, um, definitely working on developing those. Mm -hmm. and and I, think, I was going to say, ahead. I think that's so true. And I, th I think it also starts with us, right? And, and how we talk about it. Um, Jose mentioned the word stigma. I think there's tremendous stigma still in, in the community about needing to seek that resource. Um, you know, yes, it's, it's fine to. to you know, go to a loved one or a family member or, or you know, some, someone else in the community, um, but to also let it be okay if you need to go to a counselor, if you need to, to seek therapy. Um, just like you go to the dentist if, you're, if your tooth is hurting or, you know, you go see a podiatrist for your foot. Like, it should be part of the menu of, of health um, services that we access. And, you know, again, it should, it, people should feel like it's okay, right? And if they are, you know, faced with something, they should also know that they're not alone, um, that there are, there are people who care about them, there are resources out there. This is something that, you know, is either preventable or, or treatable, right? Um, but again, mm -hmm. I think part of it starts with us and how we talk about it um, to make sure that the stigma, the judgment uh, is removed from, from that. And I, think, and I think the more that we can do to, su to support folks who have access mental health services in the community um, to, to tell their story, to be willing to share their story in the community and say, hey, you know, I was feeling, uh, I was feeling down and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. I actually sought care. Now I'm being treated for it and I'm doing, I'm doing much better. I'm back engaged with my job and my family. Tell those stories and I think those are the kinds of stories that will resonate with folks and go, you know what, maybe um, it's not such a, such a bad thing for me to be thinking about. Maybe I need to talk to someone about this or see it. A, a mental health counselor or talk to my doctor about my mental health because it's as you said Stephen you know what if I had a toothache I would certainly want to go to my dentist to get that taken care of if I'm feeling uh, if I'm experiencing something that makes me think that I have mental health issues or someone has told me that then I, I should feel comfortable and and and, and actually encouraged to 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 seek help mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's so important that people know that there are resources available out there you know you're, you're not alone there are things that are going on all the time there are as a matter of fact um, you know my, my next question is is about the the kind of uh, activities that are going on um, I know from the beginning of the rollout for for the Affordable Care Act, um, the, the whole coalition of organizations that are working on this have been putting together a lot of events, going around the country, talking to people directly, you know, we know how important the one-on-one, -on -one, the personal touch is for our community. And so, um, Jose, I want to ask you uh, specifically, but also I want, I want you guys to jump in on this. Uh, what are some of those um, initiatives, some of those events that are going around all over the country? Where can people go when they need these kind of resources? Well, first of all, you know, um, we have what's called the special enrollment period. Um, I think a lot of people thought of the deadline that that was it. You, you couldn't have access. Um, and so one of the big campaigns that we're launching or that has been launched for the summer is letting folks know um, that if a life event happens, if you get married, if you have a child, if you turn over 27 uh, because you were born in 1988, now you have access to be able to enroll under these special enrollment periods. Um, so access to, to coverage is still there. It's year-round um, in states where you live where uh, there is Medicare or Medicaid expansion. Um, you know, that's a rolling application. Um, so you can actually take advantage 
Uh, here at Enroll, through our Get Covered America campaign, we're focusing on small business. Uh, a lot of Latinos are entrepreneurs and owners, and so we're looking at them not only to give information to small business owners, but to a lot of their employees because there are incentives there. Um, again, it's providing that education and access to these resources. Um, you know, folks can visit our, our site, getcoveredamerica.org. You know, if you're young, we want volunteers, we want fellows uh, to join what we're doing, and we also have various tools for folks to understand the cost and where they can find assistance. Um, you know, we're working on literacy as well. Um, and so for folks that are joining also this Google Hangout that belong to organizations that might not have a national representation, but, you know, you're doing a great job out in Texas or Florida or Arizona or New Mexico, um, reach out to us. We have a great coalition here in D.C., um, and we can work with you stateside to, to really enhance and make sure that um, your projects are, are reaching uh, further communities. Awesome. And, and and I would just reinforce what Jose has said. Uh, there was certainly lots of fanfare and publicity associated with the open enrollment period, but it didn't stop with, with open enrollment uh, closing. Uh, there are still many people that uh, deserve and uh, qualify for coverage, and we want to continue to work to get, to, get them, um, to get them enrolled. And the other piece of it is uh, it's not just about enrollment. Uh, getting enrolled and having access to care doesn't guarantee doesn't guarantee care. Now it's time for us to educate folks on how to use their newfound health care coverage. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks who are getting being covered now who've never had health care uh, health insurance before and may not know exactly how to completely access the system. So that's our next step and our next role um, as we uh, work between the open enrollment periods. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention, HHS's um, From Coverage to, to Care campaign. We know in, in our community, um, this was the first time for many folks to have this product called insurance, right? And so there were a lot of questions on, well, what is it and how do I use it? And, and so now is the time, you know, now that they've been enrolled, now that they have coverage, um, to give them the tools to, to maximize, right, that, that coverage. Um, and so, you know, again, HHS's campaign from coverage to care um, is, is one of those resources, like Jose was mentioning, about health literacy. Um, one other thing that I just wanted to note, too, and as we're talking about enrollment, um, the Medicaid program, the CHIP program um, that our community, you know, benefits from, those don't have a, a sort of a closing date, right? That enrollment is continuous, and so I would encourage folks to to inquire um, about their eligibility for those programs, um, because you know, unlike the marketplaces, it didn't it didn't end on October. I mean, in uh, March 31st. Um, so you know, Medicaid and CHIP still a, an option for folks. And I think uh, another thing that is very important as now as we're assessing how we did in the first open enrollment, um, Latinos more than any other ethnic group uh, said that one of the reasons they didn't enroll because they thought it was too expensive or there wasn't assistance. Um, so we need to continue the message that financial assistance is available through the government. Um, also, we live in a state that has expanded Medicaid or Medicare. Um, you know, that, that benefit is there. Um, when you qualify, you know, for, for that assistance, but financial help is available, and that's why it's called the Affordable Care Act, um, because there are options to help folks out, and so all those people that weren't able to enroll um, this last period, um, there, there is assistance, you know, the new window opens up in November, and so we want to make sure that those folks know that they, there is assistance and that they can enroll um, if they don't qualify for a special enrollment period uh, right now during the summer. Mm -hmm. And there, there are, um, you know, different infographics and, and things like that that I'm going to be sharing in, in my blog. Um, but I, before we go, I'm going to also set it up here on the screen so that our viewers can see it. But in the meantime, um, I want to give you the opportunity. Um, I know that you signed up for half an hour with like a minute 40 <laughs> on the chat. So I want to give you the opportunity before we go to, um, to give your call to action. You know, what can people do right now? What, what do you want people to do? And where can they go to get more information about all of these services that that your different organizations provide. 
Well, I, I think the Affordable Care Act is the most significant social justice investment that this country has made uh, in my lifetime. And so I'm, I'm proud to represent the Affordable Care Act and represent the administration on this issue. Um, there's, as I mentioned before, uh, there's great places to get information. One, uh, the, the place I always tell people to start is healthcare.gov. There's a, a, there's a tremendous amount of information there that's uh, very straightforward, easy to understand. I always say go on there, planning to be on there for five to 10 minutes and an hour later as you're sort of going through there loving this information that you're getting and understanding the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. uh, you, you'll thank me. So that's where I would send people right away. And Jose and Steven? So one of, one of the websites I was going to encourage folks um, to go to, mclr.org, we have a health reform website, um, and you can access a brochure. It's in English and Spanish, um, tailored for Latinos, in terms of what to know um, regarding the ACA. And we co-branded it with Families USA, but it's a, it's a tool that's been popular um, at the community level to give folks sort of in, in layman's terms um, an understanding of what the ACA is and, and how to go about uh, enrolling. Um, and I would, I would also encourage people just to, again, as Dr. Askew mentioned earlier, to share their stories, right, um, about getting coverage and sort of the benefits that that's provided. Um, we still have folks who, you know, didn't enroll this first go around for a number of reasons, but I think those personal stories and folks understanding that, you know, my, my uncle got covered or my neighbor got covered or, you know, someone at my church got covered. And so, you know, I can do it too. And, and these are the benefits um, of it. So uh, I would encourage people again to, to share their stories. Awesome. Um, I think the one thing that, I, that I've learned um, while being at this job is that, um, as Stephen mentioned, the, the ability to tell your story is, is important. Um, but really, it is our responsibility as a community, uh, as Latinos, to ensure that our family gets insured, that our neighbors get, in, get insured, um, not only because it improves our, you know, our social capital as a community, um, but it really is our responsibility to take care of those loved ones. Um, so not only educate yourself about your options, but educate uh, your loved ones as well as to the benefits that they have. Um, a lot of times, as I mentioned in the Latino community, the biggest challenge is access to information. Um, and so folks can visit our site. It's getcoveredamerica.org. We have it in English and in Spanish. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a locator tool. You type in your zip code, um, and it lets you find the closest um, uh, healthcare provider within a 25-mile radius. So there really isn't going to be an excuse. Um, and again, go to HHS. Uh, .gov, you know, their website. Um, they have assistance in every single language imaginable that, that will help you 24 hours. So uh, the help is there. We just need to make sure that we take advantage of it. So go out there and do it. <laughs> very true, very true. And I'm, I'm going to um, set up the infographic now on the screen um, so that you guys can see some of the, the information that they said, but also information about healthcare.gov. Um, if you have a chance to go into the computer, if you need more information, uh, this is the, the website where you're going to find uh, all of that information uh, and more. You know, just go around the site and, and they have so much in there that, that's going to help you, not just for men, but for the whole family. Um, I want to make sure that I um, thank um, my guests tonight. Thank you for your patience. I know that you, stay, you stayed a little longer than we were supposed to, but the, the information that you're sharing is so needed and so essential for our community. So I appreciate very much that you took the time to be here. I know, um, you know, Jose, your, your organization has been working, uh, you know, nonstop this whole enrollment period, so has NCLR. Um, working, um, Steve and, and all of the, the team there at NCLR. And Doctor, I know how hard you've been working as well at the, at the Administration for Children and Families in the, in the um, Department of Health. So thank you so much um, and I, I appreciate uh, being, your being here. I want to also thank the people watching at home uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to be posting a lot of these re resources that they were sharing during the Hangout on my blog, and you're going to be able to view this Hangout in its entirety at my uh, YouTube uh, account, which is youtube.com 
slash user slash Elian Ramos. And I will see you next week. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, guys. you Elian. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Good night.